So first, thanks to the organizers for, for giving us this opportunity to, to present the work we have been doing um, a while ago. With, actually, I can't pass to the next slide. Oh. Uh, with Jessica and uh, Dubois and Gislaine Dohan Lamberts on uh, actually bridging the structural and functional uh, correlates of infant brain development. Uh, through, uh, uh, through a structural MRI, a, a structural MRI and an EEG. Uh, so to start with, a, uh, I would like to start with saying that a lot of knowledge we have about uh, brain development over the past uh, 100 years come uh, from the post-mortem uh, post studies that have highlighted uh, a wide range of uh, maturational uh, processes uh, going on in the infant brain from microscopic scale, the brain growth and gyrification, but also the uh, microscopic scale of uh, growth of uh, uh, dendritic trees and uh, synoptogenesis in the gray matter, but also in the white matter with the progression of myelination uh, across the development. And interestingly, this, uh, all these maturational processes uh, happen in an asynchronous manner in the infant brain uh, with uh, different onsets at different, uh, so for example, as we see in this uh, graph, the myelination, the progression of myelination have, uh, occurs at different rates and times uh, uh, across the development along the different pathways in the brain. At the same time, the functional acquisitions of infants, the behavioral acquisition of uh, infants are also happening uh, in an asynchronous manner. So departing from a uh, sleep awake uh, uh, state, infants gradually acquire more and more abilities, interact with their environment, imitate parents' uh, gestures, but also recognize faces around them and acquire more cognitive and uh, uh, motor abilities. So one question that uh, remains less explored is, is actually how these neuroanatomical changes that we see in the infant brain are translated into the behavioral acquisitions that infants uh, have uh, in the first post, uh, postnatal years. And this is uh, a gap that uh, no, postmortem studies uh, remains unaddressed because in, in the postmortem brain, we cannot really study the functional acquisitions of, uh, of infants. Uh, so with the emergence of uh, the non-invasive uh, neuroimaging techniques, we can now study the brain uh, development in vivo. Uh, structural MRI can be used to look at the maturation of the cortex, replicating the findings uh, that uh, postmortem studies reported a while ago, uh, again, showing that uh, uh, primary cortices are maturing earlier uh, compared to the associative cortices. Uh, and again, in an asynchronous manner, and in the white matter, same uh, same uh, phenomenon. Now we can study different. Uh, we can actually isolate different pathways in the brain, but also quantify parameters in these uh, pathways that uh, that have maturational relevance. That are, for example, re uh, related to the progression of my myelination. Uh, and uh, yes, with these uh, techniques, we can still uh, go back to the same. Uh, 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 we can actually highlight the same phenomenon of asynchronous maturation across different brain networks and pathways. From the functional per perspective, uh, EEG has been used uh, in the past years and uh, we could record the brain activity to actually look at the brain responses uh, in response to uh, environmental inputs and also quantify parameters that have developmental uh, relevance. For example, the latency of the brain responses in, res uh, brain responses, uh, in response to a, a visual, auditory, somatosensory uh, event can be measured. And, uh, and these uh, latencies, it has been shown that the latencies of the brain responses actually decrease with the increasing age of the infants meaning that the, the brain, the infant brain becomes faster with, uh, across the development in, uh, in terms of the processing uh, efficiency. So uh, the goal of the presentation today that I'm giving is actually to make a link between, uh, uh, between the measures of the structural development of the brain and the measures of the functional development of the brain that can be quantified using uh, diffusion MRI and uh, EEG. Uh, so, the, so we will be uh, so I, the work is basically aiming at evaluating the maturation of the brain responses, uh, 
with respect to the structural maturation of the white matter pathways, but also the cortical gray matter. And uh, one factor to actually consider in this type of studies is that uh, both uh, structural and functional parameters that we quantify in, uh, in the infant brain, they actually all change and depend on the age of the infant. So when we want to uh, relate the interdependency between the structural and functional measures, we need to uh, basically uh, consider this common uh, effect on the age and regress out for the effect of uh, age as a general index of maturation. Uh, and uh, 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 so from basically the physiology of the brain development, we know that there should be relations between the uh, structural and functional development of the brain. Uh, for example, in the white matter, myelination of neuronal fibers basically increases the speed of the, uh, the neuronal uh, messages that transfer through the axons. And uh, so in a way with, my, with the progression of myelination in the infant brain, we would expect the, the speed of the brain responses to increase. Or in the cortical uh, gray matter, uh, the increase in the synoptic uh, density or myelination of the intracortical, uh, intracortical fibers, they could actually change the cortical responses that we measure. And uh, so the question we have, even if we know these, uh, uh, these, uh, these are true from the physiological basis of the brain development, the question is actually if we can capture these relationships with the state-of-the-art imaging techniques that we have, and uh, for this, we actually studied uh, 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 dysfunctional structural relations in two brain networks, in the visual and auditory network, in which we, uh, we actually looked how the early sensory brain responses can, re uh, can be related to the maturation of the uh, underlying white matter pathways in the brain, uh, both in the auditory and vis uh, visual networks, and also how the maturation of the interhemispheric uh, transfer of uh, responses, how the maturation of the interhemispheric communications can be related to the maturation of the uh, in, uh, callosal interhemispheric uh, connections. Um, so the, this work was uh, basically building up on an earlier study that looked at, the, uh, at, the, looked at connecting the functional and structural uh, indices of maturation in the visual network of the infant brain. So this work used uh, diffusion MRI to look at the myelination of the visual pathways in the brain and then used EEG to look at the neural conduction speeds uh, for the visual responses. So, uh, so basically uh, the DTI uh, was used to look at the maturation of uh, optic radiations, uh, the, cortico, uh, the thalamocortical uh, pathways. And uh, the parameter, uh, the main parameter that was studied was uh, transverse diffusivity, which, which basically measures the uh, diffusion of the water molecules in the transverse uh, plane, uh, perpendicular to the direction of axons. And uh, with uh, basically this parameter uh, decreases when the myelination is actually uh, progressing uh, around the axons because the uh, diffusion of water molecules uh, becomes more unlimited, uh, becomes more limited and decreases with, uh, uh, with development. On the functional side, uh, so the latency of the brain responses to visual uh, events were also measured with EEG. And uh, then they, uh, they were put into color, uh, correlation uh, to actually uh, measure how the maturation of the uh, uh, visual pathways were related to the uh, maturation of the visual responses while, uh, uh, while uh, considering or regressing out the effect of age. So this basically tested uh, 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 infants that were between four, uh, one, four and, uh, one and four months of age, showing that so once the effect of age was taken out, they actually showed that uh, uh, the, uh, the, past, the infants who had the most uh, mature pathways they showed the most uh, uh, mature responses or the fastest uh, brain responses. So, so in our work, we actually uh, tried to replicate these find findings and extend it a bit. So we measured the maturation of the visual network in optic radiations and also, in, uh, and also this time in visual callosal tracts, the pathways that are connecting the visual cortex, uh, cortices across the 
hemispheres. And uh, so again, we measured the diffusion, uh, uh, sorry, we measured the transverse diffusivity in these two pathways and uh, transverse diffusivity uh, showed the same decreasing pattern as expected with the increasing age of the infants, uh, in implying that there is a myelination going on in this pathways. On the functional side, uh, we measured the maturation of the brain responses using a similar paradigm. Uh, so the, the response speeds to visual events. This time we presented uh, visual events as uh, were basically faced, uh, faces that were presented in one hemifield, either right or the left hemifield. So with this kind of presentation, we could uh, measure the response into the, uh, for example, here the case of a right, uh, a right hemifield presentation of a face. The first response appears on the control lateral side uh, that uh, we highlight with P1, and then gradually this response uh, tra uh, travels to the ipsilateral hemisphere where we could, uh, actually measure the transfer time by subtracting the latency differences of these two responses. And uh, again, uh, as expected, of course, the latency of these responses decreases with increasing age of the infants, showing that the brain is becoming faster. But then the crucial uh, thing to evaluate was how these uh, uh, structural, uh, structural measures were related to the functional maturation of the visual responses. So, Basically, the, uh, the speed of the P1 responses were related to the underlying white matter maturation, uh, and the optic, the maturation of optic radiations, and then the speed of the transfer of the response between the hemisphere uh, was related to the uh, callosal uh, fibers uh, maturation. Um, uh, once again, accounting for the general effect of age. Uh, uh, and then looking at these correlations. Uh, so once uh, we did this first study, we, we then wanted to know how much uh, we can extend these uh, structure function relationships to other sensory modalities, in particular uh, to the, uh, in, the auditor, in the auditory mod uh, modality. And the reason is uh, that, uh, so brain networks have different, as uh, we mentioned a bit earlier, brain networks have different uh, maturational timelines. So it would be interesting to look if we how uh, how good these measures of uh, structure functions uh, that we have are in capturing different uh, in capturing the maturation of different networks. So not only these networks have different uh, uh, maturation on uh, maturational timelines that we as we can see in this uh, myelination calendar that for example uh, the optic radiations have a much more intense uh, myelination in the first six months after birth but compared to the acoustic radiations, uh, auditory radiations that have a much more pro uh, protracted uh, maturation in the first uh, three years of age. So not only there is this timeline, uh, different maturational calendars, but also the two systems are different in terms of the sensory inputs they receive uh, in utero and uh, ex utero. So in the auditory domain, the, uh, the fetus is already receiving, the auditory cortex is already receiving some auditory input. So one could think that the structure function relationships across the networks are, uh, could be different and rely on different factors. Um, so to look at these uh, structure function relationships, again, we, uh, we did a similar paradigm uh, mimicking the visual paradigm that I presented you earlier. So again, looking at uh, infants between uh, one, uh, one and six months of age, then uh, we looked at their, uh, their responses to auditory stimuli, syllab uh, speech syllabus that were presented in one ear at the time, left or right. And again, in response to this kind of uh, monoral presentation, the, response re uh, the brain responses can be uh, first uh, uh, captured on the control lateral side, but also uh, the ipsilateral hemisphere. And again, we look at the latency of the brain responses. So the difference uh, though is that uh, you know, the difference compared to the visual uh, uh, domain is that uh, basically the, uh, uh, in the auditory uh, modality, there are both control lateral and ipsilateral pathways that bring the information from each ear to the both brain hemispheres. So in a way, identifying this interhemispheric transfer time is, uh, is a bit more tricky because uh, a response from the ipsilateral pathways 
somehow over uh, over um, uh, superposed to the transfer of the responses uh, uh, across the, that goes through the corpus callosum. So we didn't, uh, for this exact reason, we could not really directly measure the um, uh, IPS, uh, the interhemispheric uh, transfer time, uh, the interhemispheric transfer of uh, the brain responses. Though we uh, we saw an uh, we saw an interesting hint in the uh, in the latencies of the brain responses that uh, that guided us in this direction. So even looking at the latency of the brain responses that I, I don't know if you could see it perfectly on the, on the screen because uh, the, the blue and uh, pink are a bit <laughs> invisible, but um, so the dark blue and red are basically the latency on the control lateral hemisphere. So one brain, when one ear is stimulated, the latency on the control lateral side and the <laughs> invisible uh, uh, pink and the uh, light blue <laughs> Uh, invisible <laughs> pink and light blue latency of the responses are the related to the ipsilateral hemisphere. Okay, so maybe I can actually present this. Yeah, so this is better. So, so what we observed was that actually the, the latency of the ipsilateral responses were actually uh, uh, delayed in the left hemisphere compared to the right hemisphere. Uh, which made us uh, uh, make or uh, propose a hypothesis uh, that uh, this delayed response might be related to the uh, to the role of interhemispheric transfer uh, to the role of interhemispheric transfer of responses by assuming an inter uh, an asymmetric transfer. So uh, basically, the input to the left ear uh, uh, when it actually when we look at the ipsilateral uh, responses. It could also it could first capture the response coming from the ipsilateral pathways, but also the transfer of the responses from the con uh, control lateral side, and that's and that transfer might be the one uh, that is responsible for this delayed uh, response in the left hemisphere. So to uh, basically investigate if this uh, yeah, asymmetric uh, transfer of responses uh, might be a valid hypothesis. We studied another group of infants with uh, a genesis of corpus callosum. So this uh, developmental uh, pathology where the callosal fibers fail to cross the midline. So they're uh, basically the two hemispheres seem uh, disconnected in terms of callosal fibers. So, uh, and in these infants, actually, there was no difference between the latencies of uh, ipsilateral responses in the left and the right hemisphere. However, uh, in the another group of typical infants, again the same uh, difference of uh, latencies between the left and right hemisphere existed. So this was uh, basically this uh, delayed ipsilateral response in the typical infants, but not in the infants with agenesis of corpus callosum, gave us uh, uh, a bit of more evidence that. Uh, the structure responsible for this delayed response might be actually the uh, callosal pathways, and in an uh, uh, and and this uh, this callosal pathways could actually function in an asymmetric way, so that the left uh, uh, ear input would uh, would basically be transferred to the the other hemisphere, but also traveling in an uh, traveling to the ipsilateral hemisphere and uh, creating a delay in the response we measure on the ipsilateral side. Uh, so with this uh, hint about uh, or hypothesis about the asymmetry of the interhemispheric transfer, we then move to uh, the study of the correlations between a structural and functional maturation. In the, uh, so we again measured the uh, structural matura maturation of the uh, auditory pathways, the acoustic radiations, uh, the thalamocortical pathways, and also the callosal uh, interhemispheric connections. Again, in these pathways, the uh, transverse diffusivity or DTI index of maturation decreased with the age of the, with increasing age of the infants. But then trying to put this uh, structural maturation in relation with the functional maturation, we did actually we did not actually observe any relation between the latency of the responses that we recorded, the P2 responses that we recorded with EEG, and the maturation of the acoustic radiation. Which uh, uh, a posteriori we uh, we thought might be related to the fact that P2 
is not the first response that uh, uh, that is actually arriving to the cortex. So it's not the response that uh, that uh, we can uh, basically measure after the uh, the neural activity has traveled through the acoustic radiation reaching the first audit uh, the auditory cortex. And this is. Uh, and this is what this study has actually nicely shown uh, that uh, actually an earlier response before this more visible uh, peak, uh, basically the, an earlier response that I have actually shown here with the blue arrow uh, compared to the more visible uh, pink arrow response, this uh, earlier response actually can be, uh, uh, and can be the, actually the, the response that is the, earliest response of uh, in uh, to, uh, to, uh, earliest response to an auditory event and perhaps that's the one that uh, could be uh, related to and um, uh, that could be related to the maturation of the so maturation of this response could be related to the maturation of the uh, acoustic pass, uh, pathways so we might have missed this relation because we are actually looking at the response that comes later and that could involve more computations than just maturation of the early acoustic pathways. So then uh, in, uh, in terms of the maturation of the auditory chylosol fibers, then we, uh, we checked on the um, uh, hint or the hypothesis that there, uh, there might be this uh, asymmetric transfer of uh, uh, responses that, were, uh, that, might be, uh, uh, that might be related to the maturation of chylosol fibers. And we found a, a small correlation in support of this, uh, uh, this hypothesis uh, and that yes, the left uh, hemisphere responses, the left hemisphere ipsilateral responses uh, were related uh, to the maturation of callosal fibers, but not the right hemisphere responses. Uh, but uh, then to dig a little bit into uh, the uh, structural correlates of the uh, development of the P2 responses, uh, we moved toward studying the cortical maturation because we said this uh, P2 response was basically a later stage of processing. So it goes beyond just the early perception or, uh, of the stimulus that, uh, that goes through the acoustic radiations. So, uh, so for studying cortical uh, maturation, we used uh, DTI parameters that uh, could actually capture these uh, early uh, uh, post-birth, uh, after-birth uh, maturational processes uh, that we know uh, involve a lot of uh, synaptogenesis and growth of dendritic trees. And so we picked uh, the measure of uh, uh, longitudinal diffus diffusivity, which is basically uh, the diffusivity in the main uh, axis of uh, diffusion. And, uh, and that with, uh, we know that with the progression of uh, this uh, synoptogenesis, the diffusivity in uh, this axis actually decreases and there has been some work showing uh, that this parameter can actually be sensitive to cortical maturation at this, uh, around this age. So for this, uh, we studied uh, the cortical areas that uh, were in the auditory regions around the Persilvian uh, areas. And we measured the uh, longitudinal diffusivity in all these areas. So of course there was an age related decrease uh, in all these uh, areas, uh, also respecting uh, sort of uh, hierarchical organization of the cortex with more mature uh, uh, primary auditory cortices compared to more associative uh, frontal areas. But then uh, the, the question for us was to actually relate this uh, maturational properties of the cortex to the maturation of the P2 auditory responses. And uh, so there was an overall, uh, the average maturation of the Priscillian areas were actually related to the maturation, to the uh, maturation of the latency of the P2 response, but more specifically, the maturation of P2 response were, uh, was related to the maturation of the inferior frontal uh, gyrus. So the variability in the response latencies in the P2 response uh, latencies were actually related to the maturation of this, uh, this brain region, which may uh, be also a validation of these uh, source reconstruction studies showing that the sources of activity at around uh, 200 uh, up to 300 uh, uh, post stimulus, post auditory stimulus uh, are actually at least in part uh, uh, localized around the uh, uh, inferior frontal uh, areas. Uh, 
so just to make a short summary of uh, what we saw, uh, that actually the for linking, uh, so basically the, the studies I showed were kind of a feasibility study to, to show that we can actually link a structural and functional measures of uh, maturation uh, in the infant brain. So in the case of uh, visual network, uh, the response, the P1 uh, response uh, and its interhemispheric transfer was related to the uh, to the maturation of the underlying white matter pathways. So the optic radiations, the thalamocortical pathways, but also the uh, interhemispheric uh, callosal pathways. In the auditory uh, network, uh, this relation was a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we uh, found the, a small link between the latencies of the P2 responses, these late, later stage uh, responses to the, uh, so a link between P2 ipsilateral responses and the callosal uh, fibers maturation. And uh, for the, and because this uh, was a later uh, stage response, we could actually link it also to some cortical maturation indices. Uh, uh, so part of the uh, so part of these reasons also can um, so another perspective basically to to explain how uh, these differences uh, of the brain networks matur maturation could change how we actually measure this uh, structure functional relationships can also be found in this graph showing that actually because uh, optic radiations uh, these early visual pathways are maturing at such a fast rate. Uh, measuring this fast uh, maturation might be easier with our DTI uh, measures, how or uh, or overall with our uh, e DTI and EEG measures, compared to the maturation uh, maturational calendar of the acoustic radiations that is much more slower and more uh, also like uh, uh, that lasts until uh, later in life, uh, up to about three years of age. So uh, uh, capturing this small. Uh, changes more might a bit more uh, might be a bit more tricky with our uh, with our current state of the art in the in the measures that we actually have. Uh, and in both networks, we actually show that least uh, uh, early evidence for the interhemispheric transfer of the responses. So there was always this transfer of the visual or auditory uh, responses from one hemisphere uh, to another. Uh, that were uh, uh, that were actually supported by the microstructural development of the uh, callosal fibers, which is uh, perhaps not all, uh, also for granted because for, uh, from the postmortem studies, for example, we know that uh, the maturation of the callosal fibers start almost at three months of age. So one could think that before that age, the, the, uh, there is almost no communication between the two brain hemispheres. Um, and to put a little bit of perspective or uh, to put a little bit of uh, um, uh, ambitious uh, aim for studying the structure function maturations, one could also think that uh, studying the functional and, uh, uh, functional and structural maturations could actually go beyond this sensory uh, processing of the stimuli, uh, stimuli for you, like go beyond this, uh, just uh, the first perception of the stim uh, stimulus and uh, basically captures those uh, uh, processes in the brain that are more cognitive or uh, higher level, for example, like linguistic processings, or uh, in this case, the face discrimination or recognition uh, responses. So for that, we actually had a follow-up on the earlier visual study that uh, I presented, where, uh, where we were presenting faces in uh, the left or right hemisphere, in the right uh, hemifield. Uh, so we had this basically face discrimination task in which we presented uh, two faces uh, in the right or left hemisphere. Uh, so one face was always uh, presented in the left side, whereas the other one was presented in the right side. Uh, so the, each hemisphere was habituated to see only one face. And from time to time, there was this new deviant faces, uh, which, uh, which actually allowed uh, infants to, uh, so if infants wanted to recognize this new face, they had to discriminate between the face they knew before and this new, new face. So for this, we actually found an evidence that uh, it was only the right hemisphere of the brain that, uh, that managed to discriminate with, uh, between these two faces uh, with, uh, with higher efficiency. Uh, a little bit uh, 
of, of a little bit uh, consistent actually from what uh, about uh, consistent with what we know about the adult brain that uh, the uh, fusiform fa uh, face areas are actually right lateralized. So these processing abilities are uh, already uh, lateralized in the infant brain, but also they actually mature. So the discrimination responses do actually mature and change with the increasing age of the infants. So in a uh, second part of this study, we had, we had actually different manipulation in which we tried to actually switch the sides of these two, uh, these two faces. And in that case, what we were actually trying to, uh, to study was that what happens to this uh, face uh, from the opposite side? Is it treated as a face that this uh, brain hemisphere knows? Which in that case meant that the information from one side has already traveled and reached the other side? Or this face will be actually treated like a new face, uh, a face that this hemisphere has never seen, in which case could actually indicate that the transfer of information between the two, the, between the two brain hemispheres is not so efficient. And for this, again, we, uh, we actually showed that uh, the, basically the response to this opposite side uh, uh, face is more uh, similar to a face, uh, to a standard face, a face that uh, this hemisphere knows showing that there is a, uh, some levels of efficiency in the transfer of the uh, responses uh, from one side to another, uh, and sort of in line with what we saw from the uh, earlier uh, part of the presentation where we show there is really this transfer that depends on the maturation of the callosal fibers. Uh, and then in this uh, whole thing, what is missing actually is uh, relating this functional maturation of the, that are responsible for face processing abilities uh, to the structural maturation uh, in the brain. And so perhaps something to be addressed in the future. And uh, so again, I show a bit of more perspective in the, uh, at the end of presentation. Uh, so, so far what I showed were actually mostly uh, focused on the linking the structural maturation to the functional maturation of the brain uh, from MRI to EEG. But uh, the next uh, perhaps ultimate step would be to, uh, to link these uh, maturational indices to the behavioral acquisitions of infants. So there are not so many, but uh, some emerging evidence in that, uh, uh, in that respect that uh, in the case of, for example, uh, sensory motor uh, development, the, the, sensor, uh, so, uh, the sensory motor acquisitions of infants uh, where, uh, and in particular in the, for the case of crawling, has been as actually associated to uh, the neural activity in the brain, uh, the mu reason in particular, uh, that uh, between a certain age, so they studied basically infants at the onset of the crawling uh, acquisition, and they found that these uh, signatures of sensory motor activity emerges at the, at the moment that the infants actually uh, start to crawl, linking basically all these uh, functional measures to actual behavioral acquisitions of infants. Uh, although uh, this uh, studying these behavioral acquisitions remains uh, in a very limited uh, in the young population of infants. Uh, so most of what we perhaps will be, uh, we will be able perhaps to study would, uh, would be more concentrated on the first part, the, uh, linking the structural and functional uh, maturation, which is still can uh, bring a, a lot of insights on the infant uh, brain development. And uh, to move toward actually a finer description of uh, structure function relationships, uh, some suggestions can, uh, can actually be made, for example, uh, that, uh, that can have, uh, that give us, uh, that can have, uh, that can give us a better description of these uh, relationships. For example, quantifying different uh, uh, functional parameters of the brain development. For example, the morphology or the amplitude of the evoked responses. Uh, so far, what I presented in the presentation was mainly the latency of the brain responses. So one could think of, what could think, one could think that the morphology and the amplitude of these uh, responses also have some uh, structural relevance. And for example, we, uh, uh, there are uh, some evidence in that sense that, uh, uh, for example, in the uh, preterm infants, some components of the brain responses uh, in response to sensory tactile stimulation uh, seem to develop uh, 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 and uh, be actually, uh, and actually uh, these 
responses are more manifested in the morphology and the amplitude rather than uh, the pure latency of the responses. Beyond the functional parameters, one could also uh, study more, uh, uh, more uh, microstructural or structural uh, parameters uh, and not only transverse diffusivity. So all these uh, uh, diffusion parameters or structural parameters could capture different uh, aspects of the brain uh, development. So in combining them and uh, uh, a true study of them can actually give uh, a more complete uh, image of the microstructural micro development of the infant brain. Uh, and then uh, another uh, perhaps interesting direction to investigate in the uh, structure function relationships would be to actually evaluate the structure function relationships within the lateral network, uh, lateralized networks of the infant uh, brain. Uh, given that there are actually already a lot of uh, uh, quite some asymmetries, uh, both in terms of a structure and function that are described uh, uh, to be the case in the infant brain. So it would be interesting to know how these uh, two aspects of uh, uh, lateralized uh, brain uh, responses and uh, uh, brain structure are related to one another. Uh, and uh, perhaps the last uh, more ambitious uh, direction to investigate would be to uh, basically uh, assess the predictive values of these uh, measures we have uh, from the uh, microstructure of uh, microstructural development of the brain uh, for the future developmental outcomes, such as uh, language or uh, other aspect of the brain development. So with this, uh, uh, I would like to thank all the infants, parents, and <laughs> collaborators. <laughs>